Chase Thomas podcast. The Chase Thomas podcast. <laughs> um, my nephew needs me to record. See, I hate. I already hate it. I hate it. All right, hello, and welcome back to another episode of the Chase Thomas Podcast. I'm still the aforementioned Chase Thomas coming to you live from Knoxville, Tennessee, Everything School HQ. Joining me down there in Tequila, Georgia, my good friend and fellow, fellow University of North Georgia alumni, Matt Green. Matt, good evening, sir. How are you? Good evening, sir. It is a... Uh... It is good to be back with you for the folks listening. They can't they can't hear the horns down. That's what I'm doing right now, sir. The whole world did not believe in the Georgia Bulldogs. Shocked the world. Didn't give them a chance. Everyone picking against them. They came out, made a statement. What a what a fantastic Saturday night that was. I I mean, I respect the Kirby bit to a strong extent where he to look in the camera and to talk about ESPN and just be like, they're all your, your network is against us, which again, hilarious, obviously because of the sec ESPN ties Picked and against them. Not that they're pulling against Georgia, but they did all pick against Georgia. No, 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 no. They didn't all pick against them. It was just the plan on game day. Like that's not everybody at ESPN picked against them. There are still people. And you look at the betting markets going into that game. It wasn't like it was unanimous uh texas georgia started at two and a half ended up at like five and a half i feel like it was uh there was what was like the percentage or was that like 70 percent or something espn's like fpi or something there this is one scenario nolan smith back in 2022 no one ever said georgia's going seven and five this is 100 percent warranted because no one was giving georgia a chance in this game like watching college game day like there was no thought of like georgia what they could really do to win the game i mean you're talking over here three days ago about them going eight and four like you still think they're an eight and four team so i think they're nine and three ten and two like i think this is a big one to avoid eight and four for them i mean we'll get into <laughs> some other problems that georgia still has and still has coming out of the game because if you're a georgia fan and you feel good about carson beck on the road or carson beck really through the majority of this season um and these receivers and georgia's passing game and their non-commitment to the run like i i don't know what to tell you but i as someone who's watched some really rough offensive football over the last uh, four weeks here in Knoxville, um, there are real problems also in Athens on that side of the ball. And I think um, that second half was kind of indicative of, I just haven't seen four complete quarters of dominant Georgia football um, this season. And I still haven't. So, I mean, I'm but still, isn't, yeah. Isn't that what should scare people the most though, that we saw Carson Beck play his, I would say his worst game of, of I mean, there's been, I think his struggles this year have been a little exaggerated. I think for the most part, he's played pretty well. I mean, there's been games where Georgia's offense isn't isn't moving, getting off to slow starts. I'm I'm with you there. Georgia's offense has plenty of things to worry about, but I think his specific struggles have been a little exaggerated. I mean, even in this game, I counted at least six drops in this game, and and you you almost can't even quantify what drops do. You know, it keeps drives alive. You know, it leads to more attempts. It leads to third and tens where you would have had first downs. I think at least four of those six drops would have been first downs. Like those and a couple on third downs that keep drives alive. So I'm not just making excuses for Carson Beck, because I, I feel like with all that said, this was the worst I've ever seen Carson Beck play. So with Carson Beck playing his worst game, he's played in a Georgia Bulldog uniform, arguably. They beat the number one team in the country 30 to 15 on the road. Like, I think that should terrify the rest of college football, because like we talked about a couple weeks ago, like, that's like a common phrase like, oh, you know, we haven't seen this team play a complete game yet. It's like, well, yes, yeah, some of those are teams that aren't complete teams and they're never going to play a complete game. Georgia is one of those few teams that's had their elite moments on defense and had their elite moments on offense. And at some point, you you kind of can expect it all to happen in the same game. And I, I think it should terrify people that Georgia could dominate a game on the road like that when the offense was ob objectively pretty, pretty mediocre. It doesn't really terrify me because I just think they're not getting it cleaned up. I think you're looking around the SEC this year, and I think you look around college football as a whole. I think one through 13, I think I texted you about it. I think they're just pretty close. Like, I think a lot of these teams have flaws, and they're all pretty close. I think Ohio State and Oregon and Tennessee and Georgia and Alabama and Texas and Penn State and um, a couple others are Miami, Clemson even a little bit. I think they're all pretty close. Like, I just don't think there's this dominant Alabama of years past or an LSU this year uh, when, in one of their dominant seasons. I just don't think that's the case. I think you can make the case that 
honestly, we're near double digits in teams. I think I could see winning the 12 team playoff this year, which is the first time see, in a long time. I'll, I'll give you like maybe one, one through eight feel a lot closer than, than most years, but I don't know one to 13. Like, I, I don't know if I can, I can't see that many teams right now. I mean, I think especially we're, we're six, seven games in, like a lot's going to change about our opinions of some of these teams when they lose two or three more games. So I think, I think there's still a lot left to play, but I mean, yeah, it feels like a, if there was a year to have a 12 team playoff, it feels like it's a good start. Yeah. I mean, I'm just saying like, I would not right now, like I would not like this, this list right here. Let's count how many here uh, with me, Matt Green, Oregon, Georgia, Penn state, Ohio state, Texas, Miami, Tennessee, LSU, Clemson, A and M, Alabama, Old Miss. How many am I at right there? Um, I stopped counting to be honest. I think I was ten because I okay. th- I felt like there was a a a, a demarc- line of demarcation after Miami. Personally, I think that's okay. a I think maybe that's top six or seven. And Miami, I don't feel like is a championship roster. It's it's Cam. Uh, why am I Cam Ward? Like. Yeah. It's going to be a, a really good team, you know, really good roster, and the best player in college football could potentially elevate them to being the national champion. Like, I think he's that good. Um, but so I feel like, I don't know, we'll get to Tennessee, but I, I think I would say there's, there's a, that's where I would, would draw the, draw the line of teams I think can win the national championship. I just think when you have the, their offense is legit. Their offense can beat anybody in the country. And when you have the number one offense, I think the most dangerous offense with the most dangerous quarterback in the sport, um, I think the you have to put them in the they could win it all category. But also playing one score games back to back to back weeks with Virginia Tech, Cal, and Louisville, like I'm maybe like yeah. I don't know. It's it's gonna be a lot about Cam Ward, but I think the um were you were you gonna say something else? Or are we getting back to this game? No, let's get back to UGA Texas here, sir. So I feel like this the theme of the this college football season for me played mm-hmm. true once again in this game it's that they ain't played nobody paul texas had not played anybody that was worth anything and we've seen all season whether it's tennessee whether it's Ole miss whether it's missouri ohio state we've seen so many teams just look dominant versus inferior competition and then they get on the field with a team that that can play with them that has talent even remotely close to theirs. And sometimes it's not like Arkansas doesn't have the same talent as Tennessee, but it's just someone with a pulse. We see it. Everything is completely different. Like Georgia has not been able to run the ball on anybody this year. And they were able to run the ball on Texas pretty consistently. Like not, not like running all over them or anything, but I mean, what did ETN have over 80 yards? I think Georgia ran for like 140, 150 in this game. Like, Texas, the best team they had played to this point, the best was Oklahoma, who who had been and, and at noon around. I guess it wasn't twelve. That game started at twelve forty five. Around one thirty in the afternoon, I was starting to feel a lot better about this game. I'm watching South Carolina absolutely smoking Oklahoma, and I'm thinking this is the best team that Texas has played. This is their their marquee win on their schedule. And you look at a Michigan team that got, you know just boat race. I don't know even what do you, what do you call it? Boat race. You only score 21 points, but got dominated by a, a, a fine Illinois team. Nothing impressive, but yeah, they're fine. There was six and one on the season now. Like that's those, that's what uh, Texas was hanging their hat on. Like they, they thought they would come in the sec and just all of a sudden, like they'd figured it out. It was easy for them. They'd beaten, they beat Mississippi state in Oklahoma. Oklahoma's a big 12 team. Like that, they came over with you guys. Like, so I think the the rest of the SEC should honestly be thanking the Georgia Bulldogs today for giving the Texas Longhorns their welcome to the SEC moment. Uh, I mean, but Sarkeesian talked about it. I just I think the overreactions have to stop. Where, like you said, I understand like they haven't played anybody, but Texas was in the playoff last year. Um, Texas is back. Like I, I'm not overreacting to this Texas home loss. They got punched in the mouth. Part of it was just the trenches to me, where. Um, I think this game ultimately just came down to Quinn Ewers and Arch Manning um, briefly had not been um, shown that kind of pass rush all season long. Like Texas's offensive line got whipped in this game, which I think surprised most everybody uh, coming in this game is that 
you saw a healthier defensive line, Michael Williams and Jalen Walker in particular, just wrecked havoc. I think they almost had six sacks between the two of them um, in this game. So Georgia is a different team when their defensive line is swarming um, the way they were on uh, on Saturday night in Austin. And I think that was really the difference in this game was that they were just they were really good. Um, I'm curious now, Jackson and Aguero are out for the first half uh, with targeting issues. Um, in this game for Florida, oh, so man. I wonder what that. Don't even get me started on the targeting calls, sir. They were trying to rob Georgia, just taking players off the field. Those two targeting calls were awful. And honestly, now, the KJ second Bolden one, Aguero, one, I, I don't remember KJ the Bolden Jackson had one, one like right in between there that was actually helmet to helmet too that they didn't call. Like it's football, man. Like both of those plays, Aguero or Dan Jackson is standing just like squared up, and like the receiver lowers his helmet. Like if the receiver is going to lower their helmet then yeah you're going to get helmet to helmet contact if you're trying to hit them like in the midsection or in the, in the shoulder like the, the also is 15 yard penalties is that not a big enough like punishment like a face mask 15 yards like if a face mask feels more like something that's like oh there's no room in the sport for that like a, a targeting is is a is a bang bang play like the fact that these dudes get ejected and suspended for the first half is is a joke honestly I don't know, man. The Aguero one was pretty by the book. Like that was one you just immediately saw and it was like, oh yeah. That's... What? Oh, Aguero by the was book, no how you teach kids how to tackle like that. Dude, that was a perfect tackle. Like, I mean, it was helmet to helmet. I mean, there's just no hiding it. Like it was helmet to helmet. Like it's, it's like it's, part of the helmet hits it. the face mask because the receiver is lowering his helmet. Like the receivers, the re like the offensive player like plays a role in in a guy hitting him in the helmet. Like that's I get what I you're know saying. What you expect. It, it's I understand what you're saying. But at the end of the day, what the purpose of the rule should be is like, okay, get tell that defensive back what he's supposed to do next time. Like, you want him to just let him catch the ball, like get like a five yard gain. Like, like I just there's no logical, you know, this is what he should have done instead. Like, th there's times where like, yeah, you shouldn't have grabbed the face mask. That's that's an easy thing to explain. Like, there's th th these these targeting calls are just they miss these guys half the time because these are some of the most, the, the best athletes in, on the planet. You know, these guys are insane, insanely athletic and they, they miss them completely sometimes. And they, they hit them an, in, an inch or two inches away from where they should hit them. And, and now they get ejected and suspended for the first half of the next game. Like th that was just, that was awful. But they sat Quinn Ewers and Arch Manning seven times, 10 TFLs, like I said, Jalen Walker was especially sensational. Michael Williams, that was that's a difference. Like if they're healthy and they're ready to go for the rest of the year, Georgia's just gonna be hard to beat. Like the Georgia's defense when they're flying around like that, um, they're just a different type of team, and that's a team that handles adversity really well. Like if you're looking against um, backs against the wall teams uh, around the country right now, um, they're right there at the top of the list. Still, is no one's really handled adversity. Um, kind of in their backs against the wall going in there like that nobody believes in us stuff like we make fun of it um at, like we do at the top of the show but like you said it wasn't like there was this overwhelming belief um that georgia was going to walk into austin and beat these texas longhorns but i do think people went too far the other way where it's like oh fraudulent texas i'm like texas is still probably gonna go 11 and 1 they have a real chance of winning it all like a, it might help them in the one end. of the easiest schedules in the entire SEC. Right, like also. Texas isn't going anywhere. So I think people who are just like, but that doesn't mean it, they're not fraudulent. I did, if they beat I mean, five more, if they beat four more whack SEC teams, like they they could still be inflated. But, Georgia definitely exposed Texas. Like I don't think they exposed them at all. This is the like, number one offense, number one defense. Like they were, they were like the best team in the country, like head and shoulder, like. Everyone had been hyping up Texas like they were a flawless team. I well, mean, I hold think, on. did you say they were bulletproof like a couple days ago? Hold on. Like, I didn't say they were, I said they felt the most. Uh, and the roster hasn't changed. I like, think they, they still... felt that way because they had beaten a bunch of garbage teams. No. I mean, they still, Michigan's defense is still not garbage. There's a bunch of NFL talent there, and they diced them up in Michigan. Um, I still think Texas is going to run Michigan's through the rest terrible. of their schedule. I think um, ultimately the offensive line was the biggest red flag. That's the only really red flag I had to raise is like the blue chippers all over that offensive line. Um, what's his name? Banks. Um, I want to say. Um, yeah, Calvin Banks. Yeah, like that. Him struggling is probably more of like the biggest red flag I have to pull away from this game. Um, but I, maybe part two is like Quinn Ewers, where I, I think this is what's interesting around the SEC right now is... We kind of talked about this a little bit, but um, 
last week, but the quarterback play just around the country, especially in this conference, is just really bad right now. Um, we'll talk about Tennessee in a second, but Nico had a great second half, had threw some darts, and hopefully maybe he turned the corner here um, with what he did in the second half against Bama. But Jalen Milrow, stink bomb, and um, in Tennessee, he's really struggled in some big games here. Um, you look at Carson Beck, he's been bad for most of this season. You look at um, Quinn Ewers, he has his worst game. And, I mean, he hasn't really been pushed. Where I think Tennessee fan or Texas fans were still kind of shaky because Arch was dealing in for Quinn Ewers for, what, two games? And um, it was like, oh, it doesn't really matter who's at quarterback, and they'll be fine either way. But then you get to a point where you actually throw out Arch. It was really surprising in that game last night that they actually went to Arch um, in that spot, regardless of how much Ewers was struggling. But – I don't know. I just think part of what Will Howard's had his moments. Dylan Gabriel struggled early this season. Maybe he feels the most sta- safe at the top. Drew Aller, uh, but they haven't really played anybody at Penn State either. So it's like maybe Drew Aller's in that category. But I don't know. I just I wonder around the the league, like outside of Cam Ward, where it's just obvious he's really good and the best quarterback in the country. I, I think a lot of these contenders just. I mean, I don't know. You kind of want to move Shador Sanders off Colorado and be like, let's put Shador on Ohio State. And then you're, if you put Shador on Ohio State as the quarterback, it's like, no question, Ohio State's the, you feel the best uh, coming into uh, a national title run. But I don't know. I just, I don't know if you feel the same, but I just look around the country and I look around the top of these standings and I'm like, who actually feels great about their quarterback situation who think they can win the national title this year? Which fan base? I, I don't know. Who do you think it is? Yeah, I mean, I think that's fair. I think some of those top contenders, they they feel like they're they have everything but the quarterback, or yeah. like the quarterback is just he's been fine, but or he's been underwhelming uh, yeah. in some cases. I think it was telling, like late in this game, uh, like it was like late third quarter after after Texas cut it to seven, uh, or cut it to eight, I should say. There was they had all the momentum. They Georgia got stopped on the return at like the ten yard line, eleven yard line. And they're sitting at third and 11 and that they drop back. Like that's when Beck is playing his worst, basically throwing his just throwing his third interception. Like, and in that, in that situation, Georgia has a third and 10 where they trust Beck to drop back and they pick up 20 yards to Arian Smith. Then the next play, they run the little reverse flea flicker to, to dealt for like another 40 yards. Like that, that really changed the game. And I think it shows like, even if Beck has been underwhelming, like I think this, like Mike Bobo and Georgia, I think they still trust Carson Beck. So it's like when they when it is time to like you have to throw. I think they feel good about Carson Beck throwing, but I don't know. I would say I would agree with your overall premise that some of those top quarterbacks have been underwhelming. I I personally question the decision to to put Arch Manning in this game. Like when they did, like I mean it's twenty three zero. You saw how quickly they got back into it. A touchdown, going for two, and then another touchdown. It's a one possession game. So to have like what, what, like four or five minutes left in the second quarter to bring Quint Arch Manning in that situation. And I don't know if you noticed on one of the third downs, I don't know. He was in for two drives. Oh, so it would have been the, the first drive he was in. Like on a third, on a third down, he tries to force into coverage when he's got a wide open dude across the middle. And it's like, yeah, that's probably a mistake that a super inexperienced quarterback is going to make against a really good defense. And so I think Quinn Ewers probably probably recognizes that guy and hits him for a first down, and it just seemed like a really, just a really strange position to put Arch Manning in. Uh, I personally thought in this first half, and then to go right back to to Ewers and to start the third quarter, and it and he seemed to be fine. It's just like I wonder what did you take from Ewers that he could have done on that final possession or two in the first half. That's fair. On the Beck side, I mean. UGA's first three drives, man. What did they do? Three and out, and then two picks. Um, so that's two bad starts. Um, on the road for Georgia's offense. One of those drives started what at like the thirty at the Texas's like thirty yeah. yard line or something. So Texas obviously didn't take advantage of the hole or the potential hole that uh, Georgia gave them. Um, in that spot, so the Georgia defense played well. But I mean, it's kind of like Lennon Humphreys had a bad drop. There were a lot of drops in this game, but it really didn't include Arian Smith. I don't think Arian really had any problems. With no, I don't think game. Arian Smith. He yeah. wasn't part of the drops in this yeah. game. But yeah, Dylan Bell, I think, had some, game. right? Yeah, first two plays of the game, Dylan Bell had drops. Like, and, and so, when, I mean, do you feel good, though, about the pass catchers? The combination of Beck, like you kind of hinted at it, where it's like, what? it's kind of, it's got to be frustrating for Beck. 
um, that he's struck like the that he's dealing with what he's dealing with. But that's part of the drop off um, of losing Lad McConkey and and Brock Bowers and Darnell Washington over the last two years. He's Rara Thomas, Rara Thomas, like Colby Young, who I mean, he was get developed. Like it's just I don't know. It's because I think Georgia fans are now like, oh, we can beat anybody. Like no one believed us, and I'm like. Yeah, okay, well, it's 24 hours later. Do you really feel good about the quarterback-receiver combination? Do you feel good about Georgia sticking to the run? Because I feel like that's where, I mean, the run the damn ball stuff started with Georgia, and the hats are everywhere, and it's like, Trevor Etienne is your best offensive player this year, and it's kind of like with Tennessee, where Dylan Sampson is the the bell cow, and they hand the ball off in the second half. It's like, Dylan Sampson, go win us another football game. It doesn't seem like Georgia's doing that with... Trevor Etienne, which is kind of interesting. I think because... it's been on the offensive line because I think I think mm. Trevor Etienne, like if you said he was the best player and he was just a, an average player, then I'd be concerned. But I think Trevor Etienne is elite. Like you just saw, there was just a couple plays he made in this game that's like two or three guys just make a miss and pick up an extra four or five yards and get the first down. Like Etienne is a stud, and I feel like they're finding different ways to get him, uh, to get him the ball. I, I think to this point, we just haven't seen Georgia's offensive line block very well. I think that's why you're seeing them throw it to him more, little bubble screens, try to just get him going however they can. But yeah, I mean, you're not. I'm not super concerned only because we've seen this past this past game look good at times this year. You know, it's like obviously six drops in a game, like that's that's massive. So whether it's Carson Beck being inaccurate or the receivers dropping balls, it's like it doesn't really matter who's at fault. That's all things that are happening in the passing game that are not good and 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 are going to lead to turnovers. Like the even the one to what to loss and lucky, like inside the five, inside the 10, like like that's a play a, a, a tight end could make a, a, to help out his quarterback, you know, but that's just a bad throw. It's like you the easy like five ten yard throw that you just put too high gets deflected and it's an intercepted so yeah i mean it's definitely it's definitely like worrisome if you're just breaking down like projecting what this georgia team is going to be moving forward but i think it's interesting how just certain teams have certain expectations and georgia's fans expectations is to play elite defense those junkyard dogs defensively and so yeah maybe you have a subpar quarterback play one game, but when your defense is playing like that, like that you cannot be disappointed in any way. Like, like you said, seven sacks, they forced four turnovers in this game, 29 yards rushing Texas had in this game. Like Texas had been dominating teams on the ground to this point, despite losing those running backs. They did this off season, their first half drives in this game for Texas punt three and out fumble three and out interception, three and out punt fumble. Like, that was just domination. Like, and that's obviously as, as a fan of a team, you're going to be biased. Like when you're not playing well, it's because you're just doing things wrong. When the other team's not playing well, it's because we're making them not play well, but that's what it felt like in this game because Beck wasn't really under the nearly, it wasn't under nearly the pressure that Quinn Ewers was in this game. So like Georgia was rattling Ewers. I don't know that Ewers is not a stud, but if he's going up against a defense like that, like, I don't know that I'm actually worried about Quinn Ewers when you're talking about the quarterbacks of, title contenders I, I think if a defense is going to play him like that like you saw what the the New York Giants did to Tom Brady he's the greatest of all time if you're getting after him like no quarterback can really do anything uh about that so I think uh at the end of the day I Ewers is still one of the best quarterbacks in the country but I think this defense is just and, and you saw a little bit of a pulse in the running game like I think as a Georgia fan, you're just ecstatic because this is the defense we expect to play under Kirby Smart. Like we're used to, we're used to average quarterback play. Like we don't need elite quarterback play to win national titles. Ooh, I don't know about that anymore because he didn't do it last year, and obviously. But Miller I'm saying, wrote... I'm saying Georgia just in general, like they've had a lot of success without elite quarterback play, and I think Carson Beck is still one of, I think he's still a top ten quarterback in in the country. I think uh, among the contenders, I don't. I mean, I, I mean, yeah, he's, he's not statistically this Gabriel. year. I think he has the top 10 talent, but he has but not you think been. Will Howard's better. Do you think Dylan Gabriel's better? Like, I don't Gabriel's I don't know. been better Maybe. to this point. To I this mean, point, it's point. Yeah. But like, I don't think anyone just has a huge edge on Georgia at quarterback that they're going to run up against in the playoffs other than maybe a Cam Ward. Like, like you're kind of saying, like, there's not that quarterback that just terrifies you. Like Curtis, Rourke, Cade man, Lubnick, there like the uh, Drew Aller, like there. I feel like I would take Carson Beck still with all those other guys. And also. How about Beck making a play with his legs to pick up that big third down late in the game? 
I mean, that was cool, but I mean, the people talk about that. And I'm like, are, he has four carries in this game. One carry the previous week, three carries for negative 15 the previous week, eight for nine yards the previous week, five he's for a pocket passer. Well, no, but they were like, yo, he's yeah. It's like, no, Stetson Bennett had legs. Like Stetson, Stetson Bennett was not like he Stetson was Bennett was a totally threat. different dimension. Yeah. But like this whole thing where it's like Carson sneaky athletic. I'm like, well, no, he's not running. Like, That's no, exactly. he's they're not doing athletic. design runs for Carson Beck. They were doing design runs for Stetson Bennett. Stetson like, is athletic. Carson yeah. is sneaky athletic. No, That's, Carson's not. Different. Like, he's not a runner. He is a po- prototypical pocket passer who can maybe do some stuff like you said on that. That's where the down sneakiness. Run. That's where it's the sneakiness sneaky. comes There's in. no sneaky athleticism there. He's a good pocket passer, but it's just like, what, what are we doing? Like, yeah, uh, you're, you're still, being really generous with that. You're still uh, hung up on those those third downs he picked up with his legs against Would Tennessee Would you like to guess how many year. interception Carson Beck has in those last four games? Oh, I know he's got, what, eight on the season. So, what, like five, six? Eight. Eight All- picks in his last four games. Is that bad? It's pretty bad. It's not good. I just, I don't know. Like, it, because Georgia's defense is so good, and that's, it's kind of like where Tennessee's at in some ways, where Tennessee's floor is so high because Tennessee's defensive line is the best in the country that you just kind of look at it and you're like, they, they can just get shut out three straight weeks and go two and one in the SEC, getting shut out in the first half three straight weeks. It's a testament to how good this Tennessee defense is and Georgia's defense, where you can, you, you're just going to be in every game this season, regardless of what the offense looks like and what kind of holes the offense throws puts you in. Um, that, like, again, Alabama in the goal line, uh, they were in the red zone and they throw a pick. Like, Jer- Jermon McCoy is this amazing one handed pick um, in the end zone, to So, Bama leaves with no points. Like, you see that from Georgia and Tennessee, where it's just really, really hard to score on these guys. And when they're locked in, uh, I, the game in Athens next month is going to be really interesting because I, I think it's going to be kind of like Bama. Ten- or Bama Tennessee on Saturday where I think it's gonna be really low scoring and I think both uh both defenses are just gonna be destroying uh these uh these offenses here um is my gut because I, I think, think both offenses Georgia and Tennessee have problems still like we'll see if Tennessee figures some stuff out in the second half and that carries over into Kentucky in two weeks they we were both on a bye this week but I don't know I, I think part of it is like we're now nearing November and a lot of this stuff where we're like, oh, just give it time. And it's like, I don't know, like we're, we're giving more time. And then you look at Carson Beck's stats and he's like 50 percent completion percentage at Alabama and at Texas. And you look at Kentucky, you look at these big games and it's like Carson Beck at home is a very different quarterback than Carson Beck on the road. And then you're like, well, Tennessee's offense will figure some but he's stuff also out. not going like, to play anyone as good as Texas or Alabama on the road the rest of the way either. I mean, Florida and non like Florida, we'll talk about here, but Florida they I mean, steamrolled a team that you struggled with um, three weeks ago. Steamrolled them. Um, Florida's figures some stuff out. They could easily have won four straight. Um, Matt Green. And I don't want to say that. We're, we're not Florida guys in this program. But Florida, I think, is figuring some stuff out. And um, just to throw it out, because we still have two weeks here. Florida's up to 18th in offense. Um, DJ Lagway, I saw this from PFF College. DJ Lagway, five completions on 20-plus yard throws versus Kentucky, most among all quarterbacks in Week 8. They're 13th nationally now in quarterback rating. Georgia's 41st. Um, Florida is 70 is seventh nationally in yards per attempt through the air. Georgia's 38th. UGA and UG and UF are tied at 44 nationally in long scrimmage play. So I was looking up some stats. I'm I'm just telling y'all, folks. Anyone who's just like penciling in Georgia just blowing out Florida, and anyone who's just riding off Florida down the stretch here, they're going bowling. They're figuring some stuff out on offense. And DJ Lagway's wow. got legitimate juice. Like I I'm just folks. I'm just telling you, Florida's figuring some stuff out we got two weeks to get into uh yeah. to georgia florida but uh i'm taking carson back of dj lagway uh all day every day right now but absolutely okay maybe if i'm starting a franchise and i got did you the watch carson, years did you watch careers, lagway on saturday night against the the, the cats did you watch some of those throws i mean, lagway. I saw, I mean lagway's got some talent i mean this guy's lagway's got juice freshman. man he's a five star for a reason but i'm just saying like yeah maybe 10 years from now like his he's got the the trajectory he becomes a better player NFL future whatever but right yeah. now I'm easily taking Carson back but I think that's the difference between Georgia like and you're talking Tennessee like Georgia's also had those games where they he back is thrown for 400 yards and and kept them in games or you know just like they've they've still had those games like that's I think that's the difference between Georgia and some other teams it's like they've had their elite offensive moments and they've had their elite defensive moments like there's not many teams in the country that can actually say that like there's some some teams like like Nico we, we'll, we'll wait. I'll, I'll wait to get into Tennessee. But like the way he's talked about, it's like I, I will wait. I'll, I'll let that. I was going to say, Nico hasn't Tennessee. even showed what DJ Lagway showed. DJ Lagway is a true freshman. He's flashed more. Um, yeah, I think that's oh. probably fair. 
Um, but fi- like we we have to get into the the throwing of stuff on the field. We have to talk about the the call. Absolutely, sir. So I'm gonna leave the floor to you because if I was on the receiving, because obviously Tennessee throws stuff uh, at Ole Miss or with Ole Miss in town in 2021, and we know how that we don't have to relitigate what happened there. Big fine. It was an ugly scene, all that. But they didn't reverse the call. Like it was a terrible call. I don't even know if people remember what happened in that game. I, where I don't actually. So they picked up Tyler Barron, like ran back. It was uh, it, Tyler Barron returned uh, a fumble for six. This is and, what 2021 Ole yeah. Miss. Ole Miss at Tennessee. Yeah, let me pull it up real quick. But as let me um, while you look up that, I was at the 2012 National League Wild Card game. Yeah, 42 Turner yards field. for a touchdown. I thought I had it right. Matt Corral fumbled, and it was a no call on the fumble. I, I didn't think I was misremembering that. So okay. they fourth and uh, look a bit then. However, the play was ruled a sack, and Tennessee's touchdown was called off. That's right. They called it a sack, and it was. Oof. Uh, it was a huge difference maker, but it sucked a lot of life out of the But that's what I thought it was. But anyway, continue. Yeah, I was at the that 2012 National League Wild Card game uh, in Turner Field when the Braves mm. fans on uh, that controversial infield fly rule. And no, they did not overturn that one either. Um, I personally, I feel like you say you want coaches to say certain things and then they bite their tongue and then you're like, oh, well, that's why he's the guy that that's in charge. He doesn't worry about the stuff that fans worry about. But I was so happy that Kirby Smart called out the refs after this game because honestly, between the pass interference and like, like I, I talked about the targeting calls, like whatever, like ETN being short on like one of the in the end zone one time, like there you could clearly see he they crossed the uh, goal line and they end up we haven't go to, uh, go to get to fourth and goal on that, and then the other one that George actually got stopped where they went for it on like their own territory, like. Fourth and fourth down late. ETN picked up that first down on like third down, and I don't know. It's it felt like te- they were doing everything to keep Texas in this game, but the the biggest one, obviously, the overturned pass interference. So this is a, a convoluted answer, but just just follow me. Ultimately, I am like happy that it played out the way it did because it it was a terrible call. Like it should not have been defensive pass interference. And I just would hate to have heard anyone in the national media, anyone in Texas saying, Oh, if that interception isn't overturned, yada, 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 Georgia doesn't win if that's not overturned. So I'm just glad like that's not a narrative that's even talked about. So the ultimately the just right call happened on the field. So like, I, you can't be like too, too mad about it, but to take you back to when the play happened the every time a flag is thrown, the refs get together and talk about it. They already got together and talked about it. What'd you see? I saw defensive pass interference. Okay, defensive pass interference. They called it. It's not a reviewable play. That's it. You called it. So I've never in my entire life of watching football seen a, a, a defensive pass interference just overturned, but just because they decided not to. And The only reason they had more time to think about to discuss it is because they were throwing things on the field. And so now the precedent has been set in the SEC. That's what every SEC fan base should learn. If you really disagree with a call, throw shit on the field and they might change the call. Like, is that what we want the fans to take away from this? Because I think that's the only logical thing you can take from what happened on that on that play. It's insane. It was one of those where in real time, like you said, it, the right call was ultimately made, but it sets a terrible precedent where I think Kirby was right about that. Of the precedent of like, if you do some crazy stuff like this, then you're rewarding bad behavior. But it's also on the officials where you're like, what are you doing? Where it was like, it was an accident. We we should have called it the other way. We called it an offense. We or called it on defense. We should have called it on offense, whatever. But it is just really weird because you don't, I understand, like, it, I've never seen anything like that before in my life. I, I mean, I've never seen that kind of delay, and then clearly the delay influenced the decision to pick it up and go the other way. But it was also like, I don't know what you were looking at to begin with, where I don't know how you call defensive pass interference to it. Like, that was just one of those in the moment, you're like, what do you do? Like, how is that? Well, I mean, like, both guys make hand, like, have their yeah, hands out and kind of make I wouldn't contact. call anything, but if you're going to call something, the guy pushing the other guy forward to get separation, like, it just, I, yeah. I don't know. It was like, what are we doing? Um, but like you said, it ultimately doesn't change anything. Texas fans can't say, like, that was the difference in the game um, because Texas obviously returns it, pick six and all that kind of stuff. Or, and all right like the, you can't do any of that you know what i mean like you can't change the outcome of uh of the game uh 
went for for Texas fans because ultimately the the call was picked up and Georgia still won the football game um, and had that big time drive in the fourth quarter for that final score that really felt like the nail in the coffin because Georgia really needed that one to kill some momentum for Texas and shut the door and it was an impressive uh big drive for for Georgia um before that final uh scamper by Beck uh, to clinch it but um I don't know I think it's just one of those where I, I'm very curious what the next few weeks look like because I think there is this idea that like now if there's a horrible call like every I don't know if that's going to be the case I think that's kind of like I think it's rare I I, I just don't think yeah. that's going to become the norm my gut is I don't think we're going to see this pop up again for another couple of years um it's been three years since this last uh, iteration in Knoxville I don't know I I think it's not a coincidence. This happens only in night games um, in the SEC because fans have had <laughs> all day to, uh, to you know, uh, get a buzz going. So don't think that's a coincidence, uh, Matt Green, that these incidents have both occurred um, late into the night um, for both these SEC venues. But, I mean, I don't know. I, I don't know what happens here going forward, but uh, I, don't, I do agree that it was a bad look and it sets a, a bad precedent um, for the league to pick it back up and uh, to for do sure. that. So it's just an were, absolute mess. And they were fined $250,000 uh, for this. I feel like it should have been a million. Well, that's uh, what Tennessee he, was fined. It was two fifty. It was two fifty. Mm-hmm. Just because this is like their first big game in the SEC. Like you're doing this your first big game in the SEC. Like because you can't really count the uh Oklahoma and the Cotton Bowl. Like this was the first like actual big game and you're throwing shit on the field. Like, get out of here. Teach them a lesson. These big 12 folk. Yeah. But I got one more, I got one more note on this game for you, sir. Mm-hmm. Um, this was Kirby Smart's hundredth win of his tenure. Uh, of his career, I should say, 117 uh, uh, overall now uh, at Georgia. 85% of his win, 85% winning percentage. That's one thing that bugged me this week is that Kirby Smart is. Well, oh, let me read you. Let me read you this. So he's 117. Uh, took 117 right for his first 100 wins. Nick Saban in his first 117 games at at Alabama was 117, just like Kirby Smart. And let's not, that was his also starting with his 12th year as a head coach. Kirby, this is year one. Uh, this is his entire career. Urban Meyer, 118, uh, or I should say 18 losses when he got his first 100 wins. Bear Bryant had 44 losses when he got his first 100 wins, but also 19 losses with his first 100 wins at Alabama. Steve Spurrier, 19 wins in his first 100 losses. Like Kirby Smart, Phil Fulmer, also 24 losses with his first 100 wins. Mark Richt, 36 with his first 100 wins. So just for reference. So with, with Kirby Smart being basically on par with, I would say, the greatest coaches in SEC history, right? Like the best ever. It just amazes me how week in and week out, He's going to be put on, if you're ranking the coaches, he's going to be put number one on the list because you know you're supposed to put him number one on, the, one on the list. But there's this offensive bias that everyone does, I feel like. And all week I'm hearing Steve Sarkeesian has the coaching edge. A few years ago, a few weeks ago, I'm hearing Kalen DeBoer has the coaching edge. And it's like, does anyone ever have the coaching advantage over Nick Saban and his time at Alabama? Like, it's just, it's insane to me how Kirby just continues to just be one of the best that's we've ever seen in college football. And he's just continually, continuously doubted by, you know, the offensive minded guy. Like he's continually picked over for the offensive minded coaches because I guess people just understand how to scheme offense better. And they, they scoring points. That's just more obvious. Like this game was like, it's not going to be looked at like when, when Lincoln Riley goes for 50 points and he's running trick plays and doing all this, it's like, it's obvious to people that, this was a a coaching masterclass, right? When Ryan Day's scheming shit up, like it's a masterclass. This was an absolute masterclass of coaching by Kirby Smart. We haven't seen this defense look like this all year. And in the biggest moment when you needed it, he shut down maybe one of the best offenses in college football. And I feel like Kirby Smart just continues to get undervalued for how good of a head coach he actually is. And I'm not just talking recruiting. I'm talking X's knows and preparing him his teams to play week in and week out i have an awesome analytical stat for you matt green to to put a bow on this hit me sir would you like to guess who leads the all-time series um win uh between josh heupel and alabama and kirby smart and alabama who has won 
more times against uh, the Alabama <laughs> Crimson Tide. Is it Hypel or is uh, it Kirby Smart? I'm going to guess. Well, you know what? The caveat here is that Kirby Smart has never played Alabama in Athens, Georgia, in his home stadium. So mm. maybe when he finally gets some home games, he can uh, he can beat the Crimson Tide. But I would say you have to be uh, correct that Josh Heupel has gotten two wins over the Alabama Crimson Tide. Two to one. Facts only. Speaking of Josh Heupel and those uh, Tennessee Volunteers, they take care of business at home once again and beat uh, the Alabama Crimson Tide after getting shut out for the third consecutive game in the first half. Um, another monumental effort from this defense. Um, just Will Brooks was the highest graded PFF player, walk-on senior um, safety, and he was awesome in this game. He has a shoestring tackle um, on fourth and short uh, to stop Jalen Milrow from probably scoring on that play, uh, which turned out to be a big deal. Obviously, the game ceiling pick, he was awesome. Jermai McCoy, one-handed pick. Uh, in the red zone for this game. Um, just so much, like so many guys played really well. And Keenan Peely um, obviously missed in the middle of the line, uh, middle of this defense. But I mean, this defense is just so loaded. Um, Alabama obviously couldn't run on Tennessee. I didn't think they'd be able to coming into this game. Milro really struggled. I also just think the Nealon factor, part of the reason Hypels lost one game since the start of the 2022 season in Nealon. It's just the crowd was unbelievable again. Like the crowd is just so loud and pe- Alabama has been penalized an exorbitant amount in the, their two trips to Knoxville in their last uh, two games in their row. And two, I think part of that reason is just because the, the crowd noise and just shaking dudes up like it's it's crazy. I saw it in person, obviously, last year with Spencer Rattler in South Carolina. Well, that's, that's there, procedural but procedural stuff. It also seems like yeah. Alabama just does dumb discipline stuff, too. Yeah. And Tennessee, they needed this one. So now. I mean, I, I don't want to put the, the chicken before the egg here or whatever, the cart before the horse, as I think the expression. <laughs> the but, chicken before the egg. <laughs> but Tennessee's a lock now for the CFP, barring any crazy injuries, because wow. they're a lock. And the Georgia game doesn't really matter. And if you're Tennessee, do you want to win that game and have to play potentially in the SEC title game and get beat up a little bit more? Do you want to lose that game close just to, you know, don't show too much. Just get out of there with a 2017 loss in Athens where the defense stands strong. Uh, but you don't, you just run the ball a bunch and you just kind of play conservative. Just get out of there, uh, get 10 and two. And, you know, uh, obviously they're not going to do any of this, but in my brain, like just thinking ahead here, I, I just look at 10, like 10 and two is just get that extra you're... revenue from that home playoff game when you're the number seven seed. Yeah, I just I look at it and I'm like, I, I just think Tennessee is now I mean, there are odds you look at the playoff indicators and stuff like that following this game. They, it's over 50 percent again, like Tennessee is in really, really good shape to make the CFP because outside of that, they're going to be favored in every game outside of Georgia. Now, from here on out, they still have two more home games after the bye with Kentucky and Mississippi State coming to town. You've got UTEP at Georgia and then at Vandy. Vandy's really the only one which is going to be a lot more interesting than it was before the year, but. Um, 25th ranked Vanderbilt Commodores, sir. Yeah. And uh, the Bulldogs ruining Vanderbilt's uh, chance to host college game day this week because of the loss. But I still don't really understand why you couldn't do it because, like, Indiana, they're not going to have their quarterback this week. And I just. Where is I, it? Is it at Indiana? It, yeah, it's at Indiana for Washington. I'm like, that's not. We didn't have to do that. You could have done Vandy, Texas. Like, we really? Didn't have to do that. Um, but yeah, Matt Green, what did you make uh, before I dive into what I thought of? Uh, Tennessee's win to move to six and one uh, on the season. I think I like most Georgia fans watching this game. Just want to know who the hell was playing quarterback when Georgia played at Alabama about a month ago, because that guy looked like the best player in college football. And, and ever since then, Jalen Milrow has just looked so flawed. I mean, 25 of 45, 239 yards, two picks, one touchdown, two picks. Like the one thing I was right about in this game, it was going to be the first one to 20 won this game. Um, it was, it was really just, it was one of those rock fights, you know, just a physical sec game felt a little sloppy at times. Yeah. Like you said, Tennessee was shut out for the third straight week. Like it's amazing to me that they can continue to do this, be shut out for a third straight week. And, and still the defense just keeps them in the game and they're able to finally get something going. I'm one thing I'm concerned about, and you finally saw late in this one when Nico was on the run and he hit that 
that uh, one on the down the sideline. I don't I, who who caught that was that Thornton. That, that oh, Dante that Thornton. One? That was a throw. That might have been Nico's throw of the year. That was just yeah. That I was think sick. so. He, that may fifty-five have been... yards downfield. And he made it look easy. That's some. Yeah, that was probably yeah. the play of the season, honestly. Yeah. Because you there were so many open opportunities. And that's what I've seen. That's my biggest takeaway with Tennessee all year. And Nico is like he has missed just about every open deep shot he's had an opportunity at in, in at least in these last in these sec games and and you're seeing guys get open 40 50 yards down the field and and nico he can he can throw that thing 60 yards but sometimes you only have to throw it 50 and that that so he finally was able to get a, a big play through the air i feel like that that could be a, a, a huge for their confidence but as i was kind of like alluding to when we were talking georgia and how nico is, is talked about it's like we're just talking about like, oh, once this Tennessee offense gets going, once we see this vertical passing game, like it's like it's an inevitability. Like we know how good Nico is. We just haven't seen it yet for some reason. Like we don't know how good Nico is. I think this is who Tennessee is. They're a team who has one of the best defenses in college football, one of the best running backs in college football, and a really solid, I mean, I mean, it's hard to even say he's been solid because he's been so shaky, but a talented guy at quarterback that we 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 think can become something but he's just a solid guy that can just you know keep the chains moving like I think that's that might be all they are right now and if he does come into his own and you know show we've seen some of that talent we've seen the the talent with his legs the talent with his arm if he does put it all together yeah this team could be the best team in college football but after you watched him for seven weeks I don't see any reason to think all of a sudden in a 12 team playoff Nico is going to be picking people apart down the field like all of a sudden you know in November he's he's now he's now hitting every open receiver like so I don't think like obviously you would want him to be and I think he might need to be that if Tennessee is going to win the national championship but I think this is what ten Tennessee is right now and I don't necessarily think that's a bad thing like I think like like we're kind of seeing with Carson Beck like Georgia with their defense and running the football that most years that should be good enough to to have them in title contention and if he can make some plays then that can be a national t title content that can be a national title winner so I think right now I think Tennessee is just kind of this team that has to make games ugly and when you have a defense this good you can kind of do that but I don't think I still have any hope that this can become an elite offense this season I don't think it's going to become an elite like 2022 offense, but I do think they're figuring some stuff out. So part of it is the offensive line is getting better each week. So the offensive line got a little bit better against Florida, and it was a lot better this week. I think especially in pass pro, um, I think Nico took three sacks in this game, but I think Lance Hurd continued to get better at left tackle. Um, they rotated uh, Dane Davis and John Campbell a lot at right tackle, and uh, they were fine. Like I, It didn't feel like uh, Nico was running for his life um, like he was um, against Oklahoma or um Arkansas um earlier in the season and I think that's huge is that for this young quarterback he needs time um the first half wasn't pretty um Nico really struggled um Gaston Moore had to come in due to injury for Nico and he throws it downfield and they get immediately pick it off um and you're like oh man this is going to spiral and it doesn't um for Tennessee to their credit but I think that's something that's going to help this offense it's like there's just no plat there's no path wow there's no path to this offense getting good if the offensive line and pass protection does not get better and it's gotten better in the last two weeks. And if it continues to be solid, I don't think it's going to be a great offensive line this year, but if it can just be solid, that's huge. Um, Nico getting more comfortable rolling out. Like it's no coincidence. I think that his best throw of the season was off platform running to his right, uh, 55 yard dart to Dante Thornton, right where it needed to be. Um, and it also hit Dante Thornton. Like part of it, Dante only played 25 snaps. I think in this game and Dante is your best receiver. He's your best downfield threat. He's averaging over 30 yards per reception. He's been really good. Um, he needs to be like health permitting playing a lot of snaps. Brew McCoy had a good game in this one. So getting him back, right. Squirrel left, I think in the third quarter and I don't know what his status is, but part of it is just, they got to figure out who their best receivers are. And part of what I thought was interesting was Chris Brazel was in the slot on Nico's second best throw of the day that touchdown to Brazel in the corner. Um, the last touchdown pass of the game. Um, I don't know if you remember that, but it was a really, really good throw um, that Nico timed perfectly. So Nico had a great second half, and especially running the ball. He had a big 27-yard run um, in the second half where it's like if he starts doing that and start mixing up, um, you know, just taking off because he's fast and he's really good in space. He understands how to run. Like, he's a good runner with football. Like, his second half, if he can build off that 
and fans not just be like, okay, it's because you don't want to overreact too much. Where you're like, all right, now it's all clicking. Now we're going to be great. It's like, well, hold on. Like Kentucky's got a good defensive line. Kentucky's got a good front. Like I think they're still, he's still learning. Like he's still a redshirt freshman. And look at all the redshirt freshmen across the country right now. It's just the, the guys who are succeeding at the top. And like you look, Cam Ward's been in college forever. Will Howard's been in college forever. Dylan Gabriel's been in college forever. Like a lot, Carson Beck has been in college forever. Jalen Miller before this game has been in college forever. You just look at uh, who the best teams in the country are at the top. Um, most of them are just veterans uh, in the college game. So it's just like, you got to keep building them up um, and looking, because this is his best conference game by far. And a lot of it had to do the second half, but Dylan Sampson's not going anywhere. And Dylan Sampson in the second half, just unbelievable. He's been a, a game changer for them. Um, the defense, though, is not going anywhere. This defense is legit. Like, even without Keenan Peely, like, Jermon McCoy and Ricky Gibson are the best Tennessee corners they've had. Um, maybe in the 21st century, like, these two are just really good. They're rotating a lot at safety. And, what, like I said, Will Brooks was a hero in this game. Once again, he's been good for Tennessee. The Here, defensive line. Before and Before you just, move yeah. Before you move too far to the defensive line, does it not worry you that this is Nico's best game in the SEC so far? And it's, like, a game where he can complete a 50% of his passes and... What were under, they in the second half? Under, two, what were, under 200 yards. What were his second half stats, though? Just like isolating. Is there a way to look at that? I don't have that. Um, I don't have that off the top of uh, off the top of the dome here. Because I would like to know what that was. Because obviously it all counts. Definitely better for sure. Yeah. I just what we saw in the second half. If he can build on that, that's huge. Um, but I thought, like I said, Brew McCoy played really well in this game. Brazel, Dante, like Brew, Dante, and Brazel are your best three receivers. And maybe that means like that Brazel in the slot because he that touchdown catch was him in the slot maybe that's how you figure this out as you move Brazel inside um and you just go to work with those three and they get a bunch of snaps if uh they can't health wise but I don't know I think Tennessee's moving in the right direction they should be fine um that defense like they have uh another less than 20 point showing um that's eight consecutive teams Tennessee has held um less than 20 points half of them are ranked like you can't even get 20 on this defense. Like this Tennessee defense is just, I, I say it every week on this program, but the defense is unbelievable. It's elite. And Tim Banks and Rodney Garner uh, in particular, have just done a great job. And William Inge had his best week as a, the Vols linebackers coach, because you don't have Peely and people are wondering how that was going to work. And he's rotating a lot and you didn't miss him. Like you, that's a testament to how good the coaching has been um, at Tennessee on the defensive side of the ball. And Tennessee is in really, really good shape now. Um, I think ESPN has them almost at 70% uh, odds of making the college football playoff now uh, with the victory. So Tennessee's in good, sh in good shape, man. No, I think that's definitely true. Uh, like you, and you were discussing the, the remaining schedule, like with Kentucky, like Mississippi state, Georgia and Vanderbilt and the conference, it's hard to see two wins uh, or two losses, I should say yeah. coming out of that. And that's what it would take to keep them out. I, I will say, I mean, Arkansas isn't one of the best teams in the SEC. Florida's not one of the best te teams in the SEC. And so we've seen them play close games, but they're definitely going to be favored in, in every game other than Georgia uh, the rest of the way. But I'll, I'll give you one reason why Tennessee is not ready for the big time, sir. Well, what is the big time? The big time. The What do you the, mean? What is the big time? The seat at the adult table. What do you mean? I, and I'll, the defense I'll is you. absolutely worthy of it alone. When you're alone. the number 11 team in college football and you beat the number 7 team in college football, is that really worth storming the field, sir? I didn't like that. I, I won't lie to you. I, I'm, <laughs> I think it's going to be the last time because you've done it twice. I mean... Did they and they ripped on both goalposts, too? They didn't take it, though. They didn't take it this time, but they did. They just down. left it. Yeah. But, yeah, I don't know. I, obviously, I'm being joking a little bit, but yeah, what is that? I don't, I don't see. I feel like you're on, you're on their level now. Just light up the cigar. That's yeah. all you got to do. The 2022, that was a magical moment. Like I think Georgia ripped the cold post down the last time they did it. I want to say it was what 2001, 2000. I think uh, when Tennessee at in Sanford Stadium, like just losing their mind because it was is such a bad era of Georgia football prior to that. Yeah. But, now that you're there, you expect. Well, I think this. Georgia's the last one. I wouldn't do it for Bama, but if you beat Georgia at home next year or something like that, or I don't even know when we play all at home again, but um, yeah, that'd be next year. Yeah, so if you do that, then I'd be okay with it. I like that kind of response because it's just it's Georgia and what they've been as a program. Like I'm okay with that, but Bama this Would time. Would Texas I agree. have torn the goalpost down if they no, beat Georgia? I don't, like Texas. I don't think so. 
Yeah, I don't know. I uh, didn't like it one bit, sir. Love the cigars. Love the smoke filling uh, filling the atmosphere of Knoxville, Tennessee after this game. But uh, but yeah, I'm not not. I tend uh, to agree. Not, not, not storm field worthy. I tend to agree. Um, let's move quickly to the Big Twelve, which is an absolute mess at the top. Matt Green, have you looked at the Big Twelve standings and like the, where Utah is now with another loss? Bit, Oklahoma State. 0-4 in the Big 12. Like, the preseason expectations were just all around the conference. Like, oh, yeah, I mean, it's going to be Utah, Oklahoma State, at the top of the conference. And you look at it, like, Colorado, 5-2, and two, BYU undefeated still, and they have a great Friday night come from I behind I thought Oklahoma win. State was going to disrupt it a little more on Friday night, too. And they didn't. They allow BYU to go back down the field and a uh, big game-winning drive for, for the Cougs. I mean, this Big 12, man, is wild because they're gonna host and they're, they're gonna get a buy whoever wins the big 12 like you get this is this is big time and it might be byu i they're definitely not getting two teams in now like there's no chance big 12 gets two playoff teams but like you look at this conference iowa state undefeated byu undefeated kansas state six and one texas I tech rule out i wouldn't rule out two teams though because this is what it takes like they I'm were expecting out to teams. be the conference that was just i mean they are still the conference at any given saturday you just have no idea who's beating who but the fact that you do have two teams that are seven and oh sitting at number 10 and number 11 you think BYU like, and uh, iowa state are getting in I mean, I don't, I don't think they're both going to go undefeated, but I'm saying like, this is what it takes. Like if they both go undefeated, they're both, I mean, they don't play each other either yeah. the rest of the way. So, I mean, if they're, if one of them's 12, 13 and 0 and one of them's 12 and one, like, yeah, absolutely. They're getting two teams in. I mean, it's crazy looking at this Baylor one and three Kansas, who was a dark horse. They're one and three in the conference UCF one and three in the conference. It's wild. Cincinnati Oklahoma three State, and one. Four. Yeah, Big I mean, 12 like, is a mess. Colorado, it's crazy that Colorado is even kind of low key, like almost flying under the radar. Yeah. Like everyone kind of left them for dead, that they're all hype, no substance. And I mean, they're sitting here at five and two. Like they're definitely still uh, three and one in the conference. They're definitely still in the running. Is Oklahoma the SEC of, or SEC Nebraska? I saw that on Twitter over the weekend. And I, it's year one. I don't want to overreact, but it, it didn't jump off to me like, no. That that's not it. Did, has that thought crossed your mind with how rough it's been for the Sooners? Their first the reference year in the SEC? being Nebraska going to the Big Ten, they just can't compete in the Big yeah, Ten. Yeah, where it's like, oh, um, you had it really good in the Big Twelve, and you you thought you wanted to go to the the Big Ten, and like obviously you take what's the Bud Elliott line? Uh, take the checks, cash the checks, take the losses. I think yeah. is with uh, Rutgers and schools like that. When you when you move up, you're like, all right, you wanted the money, now you're gonna have to take the losses because that's just. Arkansas in the SEC, like Arkansas yeah, I was would about have done to say, really well. Arkansas, I think they they competed in the Southwest Conference. Uh, they haven't competed for too many SEC titles. Um, yeah. I think the one thing that's unfair about that is is you look at the damn schedules Oklahoma and Texas got, and it's just like who's who's cereal did Oklahoma pee in, you know, before they joined the SEC? Like, oh, like Texas is gonna have to play what two ranked SEC teams the uh, the entire way. Yeah. Oklahoma, I feel like, is playing everyone at the top of the SEC, like, uh, other than, I guess, Georgia. But, yeah, it's, um, the schedule-wise, it, it definitely got a lot tougher. I just, Oklahoma's been so good for so long. It's, like, Nebraska had kind of gone through a downward, like, they'd gone through a downward, they were trending downward, I should say, like, when they joined the Big Ten. Like, it had been, like, a decade since they actually really, like, were close to being a national title contender. So it's it's kind of tough to say, but Oklahoma, like, I don't know. They've just been so good for the last like 20 years. Like, I, I tend to think they'll they'll be in the upper half of the SEC more times than not. But man, they are terrible right now. That's for sure. This offense, nothing you never feel good about going back to the guy that you that you binged a few weeks ago. They fired their OC today. Seth Luttrell um, and promoted uh, Kevin Johns to uh, co-OC with Joe John Finley. So, I mean, it's rough, but I mean, part of it's injuries. Like they're out with what they've been without their like top five receivers. Like they've been hit with the injury bug to an unreal extent. They have to replace their basically entire offensive line at the worst time coming into the SEC. Not a great time to do that. The defense is still legit, but I, I am, if I'm an Oklahoma fan, I am nervous. It is crossed my mind a little bit that like, what have we gotten? But it's also like, 
there's no way around it. Do you want to be left behind? Like you, you have to join yeah. the conference. Like you, you don't really have a choice. So the people who are dug, like, I, I'm just like, you, you have to jump in. If the SEC is saying, come on in with where college football is going, you jump in. Like you, you don't want to be in the Florida State Clemson situation where it's uh, still a big deal and you're kind of trapped uh, in a way and you're, you're worried about the life preservers and where you're going to be uh, a couple of years from now where your conference is going. But um, I don't know. I, it does feel like year one, not to overreact, but Texas is seems like they're going to be on much sturdier ground here in the early couple of years here in the sec than oklahoma like oklahoma look at this schedule matt green what are they going like three and nine i was about to tell i was about to say that to you they're sitting at four and three right now um, or four and eight say, excuse me oh over and over under uh five and a half wins for this team they have maine on the schedule still and then <laughs> don't at underestimate Miss, black bears at missouri alabama and at lsu Oof. they went in they went in one of those sec games they're not winning at Mizzou. They're definitely not winning at Ole Miss. No, yeah, they're they're going five and. They seven. need one of those to, yeah, to go bowling seven. this year. Yeah, they're going five and seven. I could see Mizzou. I don't know. Like they, they didn't look the very impressive against Auburn uh, uh, yesterday. So I don't know. That's that one's. I I see anyone with a number next to them that ranked that's ranked. I uh, assume Oklahoma's probably not winning that game. Um, final two here. Uh, I've, I've come up with, uh, this take here, Matt Green, and I'm, I'm standing by this. Um, the committee needs to come out. No, no, no Notre Dame at any cost. They're 105th in passing offense. If they go 11 and one, like the Northern Illinois loss at home should be disqualification, but watching enough, like I've seen enough that offense isn't winning a playoff game. That offense is bad. Um, they've been hit by the injury bug on defense too, a little bit. Notre Dame, if they sneak into the playoffs, it's 11-1, especially with their schedule down the stretch where USC does not look nearly uh, like what it did early on this year. Notre Dame, I, I'm sorry. like I've been a Notre Dame defender on this podcast in the past. Still a good program. I still think they overachieve every year. I need Navy or Army to do uh, what needs to be done here as the two undefeated service academies. One of them needs to get Notre Dame here this season because they cannot weasel their way in to the college football playoff and steal a spot from a bit, a good big 10 or a uh, sec team here because Notre Dame is not a playoff team. They're not one of the 12 best teams in the country. Um, keep them out. Like I, I, this is my anti Notre Dame tirade here and I'm never that guy, but this team, no, 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 no guaranteed loss in round one. Nobody wants to see this offense in round one or, or see this team. No hard out. Keep them out. They're a guarantee. 11 and 1 Notre Dame is an absolute guarantee to make the cut. 10 and 2 Notre Dame, there might they there's a chance most years 10 and 2 Notre Dame is a guarantee. But with one of those two being Northern Illinois, I think it would actually keep them out this year. You know what would screw but, like um, what's going to happen if they go 10 and 2? Is Indiana's going 10 and 2 and they're just kicking out Indiana cuz they're like, "Well, sorry, we got to get the viewer viewership. Notre Dame's in. Sorry. Sorry Indiana, great story, but we're we're going with the Irish here." There's definitely some losable games uh, the rest of the way, but they'll probably, I'm sure they'll be favored every game, uh, the final five. So I hate it. Yeah. 11 and 1 Notre Dave's definitely getting in. I think you got to prepare yourself. Uh, I just, this team, no. Uh, final thing, do you have a, you have a Lincoln Riley take here as we wrap up here tonight, Matt Green? Yeah. What's, uh, what's the deal? To steal a line from Jerry Seinfeld, what's the deal with Lincoln Riley here, sir? Are we sure he's a good college football coach anymore? Like, yeah. I don't even know. I don't even know what to do about USC. Like, I mean, year one, he had so much success. He's now sitting here. What did they go? Eight and five a year ago. Now they're sitting at three and four. They've lost five. They are five and nine in their last 14 games. Hmm. I feel like this is going to go the Cliff Kingsbury route and he's going to get fired from USC and hired by an NFL team or something like, I don't know. I, there was, I always had a little bit of, you know, just skepticism when it came to Lincoln Riley, because he, he, he has not done what Ryan day. I feel like hat did at which they took over an absolute Ferrari and, you know, it, it's it's easy in theory to keep it, you know, just running on that that same uh, pace that they're at. But it's clearly not as not as uh, easy as it looks. And Lincoln and Ryan Day has done that. And Ohio State, you could argue you could argue they're a little bit more consistent over under Ryan Day than they were under Urban Meyer, because Urban Meyer would have one game a year where they just didn't show up like 
in what five years now, um, Ryan Day, or is this is this year six for Ryan Day? Michigan and Oregon are literally the only teams that he's lost to in the regular season. I, I used to kind of put them together because of the programs they they took over. Lincoln Riley now, we've kind of seen at USC, it was obviously going to be a rebuild, but I don't know. Maybe it's a, a product of kind of too much success too quickly. It kind of raised the expectations. But I'm I'm worried that USC is is going anywhere with Lincoln Riley. And obviously there was that worry about how much tougher their, their schedule is going to get moving to the Big Ten. And like they're not even losing to the best teams in this conference. Like they've lost to Minnesota. Now they've lost to Maryland. Like, who do they play? Who do they still have left? Like, well, they're gonna be they, favored, uh, I think, in every game left. I even like but they were probably it, they were favored against Minnesota. They were favored against Maryland. Both I thought on this the was road, a pretty good both, team a few weeks ago. Right. But they also had Penn State, who's a top three team on the ropes. You come back and beat Wisconsin, you we're in a position to beat Michigan on the road. You beat LSU, who's a top 10 team to open the year. I just think they're all over the place. But I still, like, Lincoln Riley's recruiting well. He is going, like, he's going after the Georgia kids. He's he's recruiting in that area. Like, I think the D'Anton Lynn hire was huge for them this offseason. The defense is getting a lot better. Um, they're running low on bodies. Uh, the injury bugs hit them hard. And then you have, like, the Bear Alexander stuff and... I don't know. I, I'm not closing. I still think Lincoln Riley can coach. I still think he's one of the 10 best coaches um, in college football. I'm not selling my USC Lincoln stock, and I'm very curious what the next uh, few games look like for them because they get Rutgers at home, who's kind of reeling here on Friday night this week, and then they go to Washington. That's who also we'll see kind of a different styles, too. Like, I wouldn't be shocked if Rutgers played with them by the way they've Well, yeah, the and then Nebraska just got blasted by Indiana. You get them at home, UCLA, one of the worst teams in the conference this year. And then Notre Dame at home to end the year. Like, I don't know. They could. You could tell me USC went one and four in that stretch, and you could also tell me USC won all five. Like, I just, I think they're... But that feels like a poorly coached team, right? They're just that unpredictable? I don't know. They're They're in a transition period to me. Like, I think USC is kind of in a transition period. I Like, give me... Let's see where they're <laughs> what at. Are they at tra- what is this, year four? Year th- well, I'm saying, like, their their identity is just three. different. Like, they're a defensive ra- ground and pound type team. And I don't know. They're playing with everybody. Like I said, they could have easily beaten Penn State. And then we're not having this conversation um, this yeah. week, even with the loss. So, I don't know. I'm not selling my USC Lincoln Riley suck. I, it's a tough loss at Maryland to lose that game. But I don't know. I'm not, I'm not selling my Lincoln Riley USC stock. I still think they're trending in the right direction. But we'll see. I will only forgive him under one condition. Mm. I will only forgive him under one condition, and that's if he does the Chase Thomas podcast a a service, and he and he knocks off Notre Dame in the final week to keep them out of the college yes. playoff. Then I'll then I'll take it back. But uh, until then, nice. you got to prove it to me, Lincoln. I'm okay with that. It's Chase Thomas podcast approved. Can All right, I, sir. Well, uh, as we wrap out? up, how do we do this it? weekend? Oh, this is the one more nugget I had is, is related to this. So um, Zeus is home dog of the week. I really wasn't feeling it. I, I should say mm. it was home hog of the week. By Saturday morning, just everybody's picking Arkansas to beat LSU. I'm just like, this is definitely not happening. You, uh, you can't, everyone can't predict the upset to happen. It just never, it never works out that way. So I knew, I knew once foot, like once the game started on Saturday, I was like, Arkansas is not winning this game. Um, and you Try saw LSU you. take care. They took care of business, but sir, on a on a separation Saturday, we didn't really separate, uh, to be honest, um, because we disagreed on nine of the twelve games uh, in terms of win loss. I would say, in terms of that, sir, I got the best of you. I went nine and three overall on the weekend. You went six and six. Uh, I'm now leading uh, overall, sixty two and thirty five on the season. You are sixty and thirty seven on the season. Against mm. the spread, however, uh, I picked up another game on you. So are we tied now? No, I'm up two games on you. Um, against the spread, I went eight and four over the weekend. You went seven and five. Uh, forty. I'm now forty five fifty one and one on the season. You are forty three fifty three and one. So we're creeping, creeping back up to fifty percent after that slow start. Just giving the people winners for the last like four or five weeks in a row. So you know, I hope, I hope the people. The word that escaped me a few weeks back, fade. That's when you're picking against someone's pick. So people mm. could be fading us early, and that that would have been a good a good plan. But now you should be rolling with us because uh, we're we're giving the people winners these days. I love it, Matt Green. Always a pleasure, and I will talk to you in a couple of days.
Yes, sir. Nicely done, nephew. The Chase Thomas Podcast. Hell yeah.